Hello and welcome to Social Church. We're really excited to be speaking to one of the co-authors of a book that's creating a buzz everywhere in the Christian world right now. This book is designed to help equip Generation Z with a biblical worldview. We're delighted to be joined by co-author Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here. So Jay, tell us a little bit about yourself before we start. Well, I'm a cold case detective in Los Angeles County. I've been here uh, working in my agency uh, either as a, a police officer or a detective, and now I actually serve as a, a chaplain for about 30 years. Yeah. And um, my son is also here working at this agency. My dad was here before me. We all have the same name, Jim Wallace, and yeah. we have been at this agency since 1961. And we learned a bunch of stuff about how to investigate cases, especially I was a cold case detective. That was my, my specialty. So a lot of the stuff that I learned is about, you know, investigating cases from the distant past. That's actually how I ended up becoming a Christian. Yeah. And after I became a Christian, I, I pretty quickly started serving in the local church setting because, you know, I was – this was how I um, – you know, most of us, if you if you will sit still long enough, I, I had two young kids at the time when I became a Christian, yeah. and I was 35. My kids were like maybe four and six, and uh, sure enough, uh, they would they were more comfortable if I would hang out with them in the children's ministry in the classroom. So I, yeah. I was willing to do that. My wife would do it one week, I would do it the next, and then then either one of us would go in the big church. Uh, on other the other week, right? So we would be able to kind of help out and and get our kids comfortable in that setting. Well, if you sit still in a large church for very long, uh, I learned pretty quickly that <laughs> yeah. you end up uh, being asked to serve. You know, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I sure enough, I was starting to teach children, and then I I went to seminary, got a seminary degree, became a pastor, became a youth pastor, and I started working with high schoolers. And my kids were about that age anyway, so I kind of followed them up as they grew, yeah. and uh, learned a lot during that process that I hope to pass on now, uh, because what I, I see in culture, uh, my primary concern is Gen Z. It's uh, that generation behind the millennials that, mm. that um, kind of, if you've got a high schooler or a preteen right now, you've got a kid in your family who's what we would call Gen Z or iGen, it's that, that post-millennial generation. Yeah. And that generation faces unique challenges. Yeah. especially if you're going to try to convince them or try to share with them the Christian worldview in a very distracted digital age. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Sean McDowell, you know, his father is Josh McDowell, the, the, the famous apologist. Uh, we've been working with young people for a long time, and we decided we'd partner together and write this book to help um, really three groups, parents, uh, youth pastors and Christian educators, all of those people are going to have contact with Gen Z. Yeah. And if you're a Christian in one of those three categories, you may have discovered that it can be difficult, even though you may know what is true, it can still be difficult sometimes to pass that on to mm -hmm. the next generation. That's mm -hmm. what we're trying to help you with in this book. What's unique about this generation, Jay? What, 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 uh, are, the, what are the typical challenges they're going to be facing and why is it so hard? Well, I think because this is uh, every time technology changes and ushers in a new technological age or a new age of civil, I mean, we really are on the precipice of this, and we may not even realize it. You know, as as, as striking as the industrial age in terms of its ability to change culture, uh, that took a lot more time than this information age has been able to change culture. We're in a technology a technological uh, age that has turned a corner mm -hmm. on civilization in a way that we probably will never really truly appreciate until maybe 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. And so what we have, uh, we've all now adopted this technology. We're podcasting, we're using the digital technology online, and we all, for the most part, possess smartphones, it seems like, of one nature or another. And mm -hmm. this isn't the first generation that was born with all the technology available from day one. So whereas I am a digital immigrant in the sense that I came to this later, I got a phone in my, I guess in my 40s or 30, late 30s, I'm 57 now, this generation has, they are described almost universally by everyone who polls and does the study, the most important single characteristic, it seems to me, is that they are digital natives. Mm -hmm. They have been raised in this environment, and that, that changes everything because it changes. This is a, a they are being raised with access to every kind of information you could possibly have. They're great researchers. They're great fact checkers. They are connected globally. They they are starting to embrace the values that are global values and not just regional or local values because mm -hmm. they have access to the global network. 
They also, interestingly, are the least trusting and loneliest generation, it seems. You might think, well, how can you have, how can that be the case if you've got more access to your friends than probably ever before? Yeah. Well, we've exchanged digital access to our friends for physical proximity. Mm -hmm. And there is an aspect of that that is dangerous in the sense it can create great loneliness because it's much easier to craft a, um, a, a persona to craft a, a vision or a version of yourself that may or may not even be true uh, in this generation than it would be in any other generation, right? So mm -hmm. there is a sense that these are some of the obstacles we have. I mean, it, just on a very practical sense, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to even be heard in this noisy world. It's, it's more difficult probably now for parents to be heard, for teachers and, and pastors to be heard, because so much of what p uh, young people might rely on for information is now outside of their uh, physical uh, relationships that they have with real people. So I think it's, it's important for us to understand that, understand really what this digital uh, environment does in terms of how, pe how young people learn, mm -hmm. how young people access information. And, and if we don't conquer that, if we don't, this genie is not going back in the bottle. So, yeah. so we can say, oh, no, it's, it, it shouldn't be this way. <laughs> really? I mean, when, when, the, when the phone was first invented, not the digital phone, I'm talking about the old analog phone. Yeah. When that was first invented, I'm sure there were people who said, I wish I could put that genie back in the <laughs> bottle, but that never went back in the bottle either. So yeah. I think we have to learn to embrace the technology and use it for our advantage. Yeah, sure. You, you, you mentioned before, Jay, that you spent the first 35 years of your life as an atheist. How's this influenced how you approach non-believers yourself? Well, I'm patient. Uh, you know, I'm patient even with young people. So even with my own kids who are now grown, they're like 30 to 22. Mm. Uh, so that that range of, of, of young, young people, I, I mean, I think there's lots of us who, who feel like, wow, you know, wherever I did as a parent, maybe I wasn't as successful as my life, and, and I wish that my kids were X, Y, or Z, and they aren't, well, really, I, I was none of those things. If you'd have asked anyone who knew me at the age of 34, mm -hmm. if uh, my partners, for example, if you say, hey, is Wallace ever going to be a, a, a Christian, you think? They would have said, no way. Yeah. <laughs> and, but God does what God will do, and mm -hmm. so I've learned to be patient and realize that, that there's Sometimes this is a process that God uses for, for good reason, because something beautiful is on the backside. So I think the one thing it has done for me more than anything else is just give me great patience with people, and I don't panic. You know, I don't I don't feel like um, it, all the the, the the cause is lost. You know, if, if someone's uh, in their thirties, for example, and yeah. uh, it seems to be still be resistant, well, there's time. <laughs> and, yeah, and so yeah. I I think I just stay the course. I also think I, re I realize that a lot of this is about relationship building and that's one thing that we talk about in this book more than anything else you know mm -hmm. tempting when you're teaching christian apologetics or teaching christian worldview and a lot of what we're going to have to do with our young people is going to be about teaching christian worldview evidentially because they've got a lot of questions about the christian worldview evidentially so we're going to have to address some of those questions mm -hmm. and we have a tendency to think of that as purely information you know we just make the case truth claims truth claims truth claims when when a large part of this is it's always going to be a relationship it's relationship and it's, it's it's truth claims in the context of relationship you cannot divorce these two things mm -hmm. and so we talk about in the book how how parents and and uh, people who are engaged with gen z can simply understand this relationship and can can use that truth the truth that you have to marry the ideas and the concepts and the truth claims of christianity to you as a relational uh, being who has formed deep relationships with young people and, and you cannot exchange one for the other it's a both and and that will help you i think and so a lot of this is just talking about how to connect with gen z yeah brilliant who did you and sean have in mind when you as you was writing this book jay well when we first started you know we both teach at viola yeah and Biola is a university out here in Southern California. Uh, it's one of the larger and kind of better uh, positioned universities, Christian universities in the country. And we teach in the MA program through Talbot Seminary here at Biola, uh, the MA program in apologetics. Yeah. And we knew that the biggest, the largest number of people who are kind of walking away from the church who would kind of identify themselves maybe as non-believers at an earlier point is Gen Z. Mm. So if you've got Gen Z kids being raised in the church, it's a far greater chance that they will walk away uh, than any other generation right now. And they're going to be the largest generation demographically in the, on the planet probably in the next five years as boomers are dying. Because this is a baby boom again all over again. It's in Gen Z. 
So we knew this is an important group. And there are lots of youth pastors who are actually getting their master's degrees in one thing or another, and a lot of them are getting their master's degrees in apologetics. So we thought, you know what, what if we could focus on youth pastors to help them prepare the next generation with the claims, to be able to make the case and have confidence that Christianity is true. But here's the problem. When Sean and I first started talking about it, Sean was very excited about preparing youth pastors, but I knew really that's probably an audience of like 10 people right now yeah. right we have to convince youth <laughs> pastors this is worth doing first but yeah. i think there's a real sense amongst parents who are sensing right now almost every parent in an audience i speak to mm. has an anecdotal story of a young person either their child their niece their nephew their grandchildren someone within their family who has rejected the claims of the church and walked away mm. And I think that sense of te- we need to be able to help people respond to that truth, yeah. respond to that reality. Yeah. And so that's where I think we said, okay, so here, what are the three groups? Well, they're parents, they're youth pastors, and they're Christian educators who deal with Gen Z. So those are the three people. Every chapter has a breakout. So you can, and if you're in one of those three groups, we're going to give you tools, um, some really practical. This is an intensely practical book. It's not philosophical. It's really about what yeah. can you do tomorrow to change the nature of the conversations you're having with young people to help them know that Christianity is true. Yeah, that's good. What do we need to do to help equip the young people with a biblical worldview, Jay? Well, I think we need to move um, a little bit toward the very practical... Okay, so there's lots of practical tools we're trying to offer here. One of them... I think that one of the bigger dangers to theism amongst young people is not so much atheism as it is well, we are now kind of hearing the term apatheism, you know, this yeah. idea yeah. that, that is, you know, it doesn't really matter. I don't know why any of this stuff really matters. This is, a, like I said, it's very noisy. And even the ideas about what is the purpose of life, mm-hmm. what is, you know, th- there's a lot of noise in those categories. So, so I think what we have to do for young people is to help them see uh, the importance of the Christian worldview. And a simple kind of tool that I think will help everyone is this notion of, of um, and I talk about it in one chapter of the book, we started doing this in Youth Pastorate, and it really changed the way I was doing sermons. It, yeah. it changed the way I was uh, having conversations with my own kids. And that was simply, I began to give two whys for every what. So whereas you might in the past be talking to young people or anybody, well, this is true for anybody in this generation. One thing about the digital technology is it seems to level out the generation. So, so whereas my mom might have been, your grandmother might have been very different than you 50 years ago because she experienced different things. Well, mm-hmm. actually, my kid's grandmother is now using the same technology that they're using. And she's texting, she's on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> the technology is a way of kind of, making all these generations somewhat similar. So this approach I'm suggesting, two whys for every what, is not just for young people. I think it actually is important for any generation right now. So here's what I mean by two whys for every what. So instead of just simply teaching and making a claim for your kids, this is what's true about God, this is what's true about Jesus, this is what's true, what, 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 what. Uh, Add two whys every time you give a what. So the first why will, will be, well, okay, so why do I think that claim is true? And it may mean having to be able to make the case from Scripture, or it may mean having to make the case from outside of Scripture. I, I've written books on this, Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, where I'm using science, I'm using philosophy, I'm using many other forms of evidence to make the case for the Christian worldview outside of Scripture. And I think young people want us to do that, because the other worldviews that they are reading about online, those other worldviews claim that what they have is true, and they can demonstrate it with science, let's say. And you Christians, your parents, they have a blind faith that cannot be demonstrated with science, therefore you should reject such things and only embrace those things you can demonstrate with science. I mean, I hear this all the time from young people. And, and so I think we need to be able to make the first why. Why is this true? That's another burden on us. We have to, if you don't know why it's true, then you've got to take some time to learn that, not just for you, but for your kids. Yeah. And the second why is, okay, you've demonstrated that it's uh, what the claim, here's the claim, here's why you think evidentially it's true. Now, why should I care? Why, why is this important to me? I, I'm yeah. 17, and I don't, I tell you, this might be important to you, and it's a very ancient claim, so that's all well and good, but why should I care about this claim? What's in it for me? Mm-hmm. 
And I think that's something we want to be able to help. I mean, this is, we are, this is an intensely individualized culture right now that's highly in, uh, uh, involved in feelings and emotions and, and what is subjectively true. So I think this is the one generation that wants to know what's in it for me. And I think that we can at least offer that, right? Mm-hmm. So that second why is now if you've got – if you've been making claims as a parent and you've never thought about the whys behind your what's, then it can, this can be a little bit intimidating, right? But I mm-hmm. think that in the end, you, you have whys behind what's in a lot of other categories at your work, um, you know, and, and, and other issues that you deal with. This is now time for us to, in our own minds, do what Peter talks about in First Peter 3, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Be ready to have the reason, uh, to get yeah. the reason for the hope you have in, in Jesus. Well, if nobody else should hear it from you, it should at least be your kids. Help them know why this is true and why it matters to them. Yeah, that's good. What's one of the most common questions you hear? Uh, you know, I think almost all of So uh, we do a lot of talks, uh, Sean and I, both in youth yeah. groups and, I, and on college campuses. And at the end of those, you know, you'll often open up to a Q&A. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the largest uh, kind of percentage of questions I get at the college level or high school level will almost always um, center on some aspect of the problem of evil. You know, either that natural evil or why is the world the way it is given that there's supposed to be a god who's all powerful enough and all loving enough to stop this you know why isn't he stop? he's not powerful he can't stop it or he doesn't want to stop it i mean how can he be all loving and all powerful and they still have all this junk happening not only that a lot of people will argue that god it must be evil or the source of evil or if you look at the old testament god yahweh who's you know destroying entire cultures blah 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 of how do i uh, account for either something bad that's happened in my life or something bad that I think God has done. So I, I think that, that it, those are the largest c- categories, and they always are somewhat nuanced. And I think, if you, I think parents sometimes feel overwhelmed by those kinds of questions and, and maybe don't feel as, um, as ready to, um, to be able to respond to those kinds of questions. So I do think um, this is going to raise the bar for us. Yeah and going to cause us to have to be in a position where we can, you know, where we can actually um, address those issues. It's not, it, it, and I, a lot of times you'll talk to, I talk to parents who will say, well, I don't really have a need of it myself, personally. I, 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 I'm confident. I don't have a, I get that. I get that, that you and I might be confident, but our kids aren't always confident for no other reason. Learn, and, and by the way, uh, we get this sometimes. We'll go to events where we're speaking, and uh, a parent will come up afterwards and say, "Hey, my daughter's you know 25, and she's no longer in the church. Can can you please sign a book, one of your books, for her?" Mm-hmm. And of course, we're going to say yes. But I always tell the parent, "She's not going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> okay? yeah. She she doesn't want this answer from a stranger like me. Yeah. It it turns out all along she wanted this answer from someone like you." Yeah. We have to become the best um, Christian apologists that our kids know. I, I always say it this way. Um, you know, we don't need another million-dollar apologist. We need a million-one-dollar apologist. We need every parent to see this va- the value of this, uh, if for no other reason than to help answer the questions for their own kids. Yeah, that's brilliant. Jay, you, you're so good at answering questions. I just wondered, what's the hardest question you've ever been asked? Um, you know, I think a lot of them, are the, the hardest questions in a digital age yeah. are the questions that are require answers that are... Uh, larger than 280 characters. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. it, it, those are the hardest questions right <laughs> yeah, now because yeah. because they, they have, if it's a more nuanced, um, and I'll see this on Twitter all the time where someone's trying to have a conversation and they'll break their answer into like four tweets, yeah. right? Well, yeah. no one's going to give you the time to get past the first tweet. I'll just be honest, they're not. Yeah. And and so questions that are that require a, um, and this is, this is tough, right? Because some of these questions, and this is true also when you make cases in jury trials. I think there's a sense that if I can't answer this question in 280 characters, I must be – it's a bad it, – it, you, you really can't answer it. Yeah. Or in other words, um, your answer is invalid. If it's that hard for you to answer where you can't answer it in the briefest possible you know, millisecond, well, then obviously you, know, you, you don't have a good answer or your answer is, is not true. Yeah. But the reality is that in criminal trials is that these things take weeks in front of a jury – to make the case for something that really happened, yet it's nuanced enough where it takes you know thousands of words 
to, to make the case for truth. Well, that, that is true for biblical uh, things as well. So, so when someone says, well, you know, the Bible condones slavery. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's going to take a little time for me to explain yeah. really the definition of what biblical slavery, quote-unquote, it looks like yeah. compared to New World slavery here in America, because most people think that term is the same in both contexts. Mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. So now I'm, I find myself in a position where I, I can't just tweet it out quickly, rhetorically, powerfully. By the way, the... the, the um, the, the complaint, the objection, is often short and rhetorically powerful, and our kids are going, ooh, that's yeah. the, the yeah. meme sometimes. You know, they'll put a <laughs> yeah. meme out there, and our kids will see that meme and go, oh, man, yeah. is that true? Oh, yeah, okay. So now now the response is not going to be a meme. It's not going to be a – and so what do you have to do, I, think, I find – it's funny, I've got a friend named Frank Turek, yeah. who spends a lot of time on college campuses as well. That's been kind of the basis of his ministry. Yeah. And I'm the somebody who will want to take the time to give you the more robust answer. Yeah. Frank's somebody who's like, no, 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 you that, that you got to do this in about a minute, talk, yeah. a minute. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm like, wow, you know, he's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I am more inclined to, to, to give you a long answer to a short question. But Frank knows that in this generation, that answer has to be brief, and 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 you know it's and it has to be rhetorically powerful, and I think that's one thing that the technology has shifted in terms of how we t- talk and how we. So they always say that millennials had an attention span of around eleven seconds, and that Gen Z has got an attention span of around eight seconds. Well, yeah. uh-huh. that's kind of it can sound to me pejorative in the sense that oh these people these kids don't even have a long attention span no they of course they watch three hour movies yeah. but what you'll see in the three hour movie is a scene change about every five to eight seconds a different angle a different camera angle it's not just going to be one person talking with the camera focused on him for you know his entire 30 second dialogue no it's not going to be that it's going to break and give you over his shoulder from the side from the front the reaction of the person he's listening to all these different camera angles because this is what this digital technology has done to us. It's made all of us visually impatient. You know this. If you're standing in line, I always think if you've got a phone in your pocket and you have to stand in line someplace, how many seconds go by before you pull that phone out? Yeah. You can't even stand in a line for five seconds without pulling out a phone. (laughs) We have become incredible multitaskers. We have become incredibly, uh, uh, our attention spans are shorter and we want stimulation at uh, more often. And so our, our, how we communicate, the, the, now you can argue, well, that shouldn't be this way. And we should be, okay, you could do all that arguing until you're blue in the face. Mm-hmm. This is the reality of where we are. Is it possible to make the same claims about the nature of God, the importance of the Christian worldview, the moral foundations of, of a Christian worldview, the moral teaching of the Christian worldview? Can you make those claims in this environment? Of course you can. Well, you have to kind of learn to speak a more nuanced, a, a, a language that's going to be really adaptive to what we, of course you will. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to do that. I think if you love kids, if you love young people, all of us are going to have to be willing to do that. Yeah, so good. Jay, congratulations to you and Sean for writing this book so the next generation will know. If any of the listeners want to get in touch, Jay, where's the best place for them to reach out to you? Well, uh, our website is coldcasechristianity.com. That was my first book, and so that's our ministry name, coldcasechristianity.com. You'll see all kinds of free, downloadable resources. Parents uh, need uh, resources. And let's face it, uh, it can be overwhelming. So we try to organize everything there and provide resources there that are entirely free that you can download to uh, kind of ramp up to become that kind of person for your own kids brilliant well we'll put a link to that in the description below um jay jay thank you so much for your time i've really enjoyed speaking to you today hey thanks for having me i so appreciate you